What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm excited about today's guest. You know, Gray, I always like to mention other episodes that people should check out. Um, people can check out, especially because we're going to talk about agency life a little bit. And this will be kind of part of the top agency series. Everyone should check out the episode I did with Jason Swank and check out what he's doing with his podcast and his group. It's amazing. I did an episode with Chris Martinez of the Dude Agency. Also, uh, a really interesting guy in, in the business he's built. Uh, Duncan Olney, check out his website at Firebelly. I know we that's a mutual friend of Gray and I's. Um, so check out Firebelly and they have a, an amazing podcast as well. And Dean Dutra, worth e-commerce. You know, this is if you have an e-commerce site and you actually want to generate and own your, deploy your media whenever you want with email marketing, SMS marketing, that's what they help people do. So check those episodes out. Um, and before I introduce Gray, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. And, you know, Gray, the way I explain what we do is you could tell me this is a good way of explaining it or not. But I say we help people connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. So there's an actual strategy behind it. And the strategy is giving to your relationships. Okay. Like that's what everyone should do. And the number one thing in my relation, you know, in my life is relationships. So I'm always looking at a way it is. How can I give to Gray and, you know, and Zen Pilot? How can I give to people I know in my network? And one of those ways I can give, which I found over the past 10 years, is to have them on my podcast and then profile them and then distribute it across like 20 different places. So if you've thought about starting a podcast, I think even before it was self-serving, Gray, I would say, if you have a business, you should have a podcast, period. I know you guys have a podcast as well. Um, if you have questions about it, we're happy to answer them. Go to rise25.com and you can email uh, our team, you can email me personally, and we're happy to do it. We've been doing it for over a decade now. So check that out. Today, we have Gray McKenzie. He's CEO of Zen Pilot, and they give digital agencies the structure they need to grow quickly and sustainably. And they've helped over 1,600 agencies over the past 10 years. And he's also the founder of Guava Box. And this stems, you know, I think you you talk about this, that you and your co-founder just wanted to do something together. You want to work together. You want to start something. And this, this stems all the way back to college. So, but you could go to zenpilot.com and check out more of what they're working on. So great. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, Jeremy, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You mentioned relationships as the number one thing. You're such a good uh, connector. I was actually just talking with somebody last week who's a 20 year old into a podcast, uh, really into podcasts, trying to build a podcast production agency. And I was like, man, you should just, talk to Jeremy. You should see about going and working there. Just tell him up front. I want to build my own business at some point, go work there, figure out what it's like, if you like it or not, be upfront about your intentions. And you could probably learn a lot just from being inside of him. Have you always been a connector and like just wired the way that you are? Or is that something that's, was there some experience that, that flipped that switch? Yeah, no. Um, you know, actually, yeah, yes. I mean, there's people out there. I think that you find just our natural recommending of people. They, they're, they're, you know, evangelists of things. Right. And, and I've always, I feel like always been like, Oh, if I see this movie, I'll like go out and tell like 30 people. Yeah. Like it, there's no benefit to me. I'm just like, Oh, you got to check this out. So I've kind of naturally wired that way a bit um, to just, if I like something telling people about That's it. A that's awesome. You know, a service, a person. And, you know, I probably make, you know, five to 20 introductions every single day um, to people. Right. And think I do double opt-in, right? So I'm asking both parties. So I'm probably sending like 40 emails just to make the 20 connections, right? Or actually more than that. You more just emails. using Gmail? This is a silly question, but yeah, no, I use answer. Gmail. Yeah. But um, I use one of the th things I use is text expander. So um, I don't know if you've used it before. Yep. It's like $4 a month. And so I save everyone's bio. Like I have your bio saved. And so when I want to make an introduction, I just write intro gray McKenzie and your nice looking thing that I pre-wrote comes up and I can send it off to people. 
That is so, really smart. Yeah. You know, what what's your uh what's your snippet structure? Is that what you're doing? You're actually writing Yeah. Text, yeah, I put my trail. snippet structure is if you're geeking out on this for a second, we'll get to the con- yep. I mean, this is part of it. You know, this is you know, I've done full uh got on a, a a call with like 15 of someone's team members and I've explained text expander like wait, Jerry, what do you do? I'm like, "No, I don't represent text expander." Right. <laughs> it goes into that referral thing, but yeah, my snippet structure is like intro, first name, last name. And then I have everyone. So if I introduce you once, I just save your bio in Text Expander. So if you haven't looked at Text Expander, um, look at it because it's a great productivity tool. I mean, some of the product, I'm, you know, this kind of goes into, I'm curious of the productivity tools you use. I use SaneBox, LastPass, Text Expander. Um, you know, those are a few co- come to mind. I mean, obviously you love, click up what are some of your productivity or tools yeah. or apps that you like i'm using the same uh text expander for text expansion click up obviously for project management um had used superhuman for email and switched back over we're using hubspot as our crm so i'm just using the gmail interface right now uh primarily just because it's easier to have emails logged and uh tracked in hubspot um we're doing a lot lately with integramat and zapier so automate i don't know what integramat is what it's like the nerdy you're familiar with Zapier? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the nerdier Zapier. And the main mm-hmm. reason for it is they go deeper in terms of custom uh field integrations inside ClickUp. So wiring mm-hmm. data back and forth. Uh, is that their tagline, the nerdier Zapier? Or what's, it's what's it's not. That's it's okay. official. I'm sure they wouldn't be happy that I said that, that I even brought up their competitor. <laughs> but everyone knows Zapier. Uh way fewer people, you know, it's, but you it is a more technical platform mm. tease it's not as user-friendly as zapier is uh but it's it's very powerful anything else that you're using it's a good question let me go to so so you like we, hubspot over you're a hubspot ninja i mean you know when you were fully i know you're you're focused on Zempilot, but in when you were doing guava box i mean you guys you know helped right people with gr- accelerated growth plans b2b companies yep. using a lot of hubspot stuff yeah yeah, we were HubSpot partners way back. I mean, there were 400 partners when we joined in 2012. Um, so part of the HubSpot attachment today, I'm sure, is still just legacy. That's what we know, and change is hard. But I do like the the sales tools that they've built out in the interface um, quite a bit. At some point in time, it'll probably make sense, and we'll try and be early on the train to move CRM stuff into ClickUp. Um, but ClickUp. Why haven't really- you so far? It just doesn't the, integrate with email yet. Um, they just launched email. You don't have email tracking. It's not uh, as smooth as HubSpot is. The merge fields or contact pro- there's not contact properties tied in to ClickUp. So if you're trying to um, automate any type of emails yeah. or sequences, that doesn't happen. And then the relationships it's still very early days with ClickUp as a relational database. But in any CRM, obviously you've got your contacts, your companies, and your deals. And those relationships get automatically connected for you. And in ClickUp, it's not automatic. In, in HubSpot, right you now. And uh, in ClickUp, it's not automatic. In oh, HubSpot, right. it is automatic. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I've used PipeDrive. I use Contactually, yep. you know, so that integrates easily. So if you want to put them into a, a pipeline, you already have kind of the email exchange and the contact information. I don't know if ClickUp right. is doing that right now. Yeah, you can. Um, you've got all these custom fields. You can have an email field. If there's one email field, and you draft up an email, click will assume that that's the email you want to send it to. You can override it. Mm. So it's um, it's certainly got promise. I know that that's been a push for them inter- for their own internal use case um, using ClickUp as, yeah. a, as a CRM. But so any I, other I tools, software, what do you do? You use anything for email campaigns itself? Right now we're using ConvertKit. Okay. Um, We've been on that for about a year after switching away from HubSpot. We may actually go back to HubSpot at some point. So we keep, one of the things that we do, we're working with an agency. Um, we're helping them stream on their systems and processes inside ClickUp. One of the things we give them is this cool interface, basically how you manage your whole tech stack inside ClickUp. But built into that, it's kind of, hey, here's our recommended or here's the, yeah. the agency tech stack that we know of. And you may not want to use all these tools, but here's what we do with them, how much they cost, you know, how you track them and all that kind of stuff. So, um, we'll, some, there's been cases convert kits, one of them where we went to a tool 
not sure that it was the right tool for us, but to just try and get familiar and figure out, hey, is this the thing that we should recommend to agencies or not? We may be switching to active campaign at some point and then probably cycle back to HubSpot. We just switched. Like we just switched to active campaign. The active campaign. How's that experience been? I mean, so far so good. It's, it's early yeah. to tell, but I mean, a lot of people recommended it. Right. And I actually had the founder on my podcast. Um, he actually also happens to be in Chicago where I am. And, um, but I mean, they are, I mean, he's like a technology first. So I like that, um, yeah. that approach and they're, they've been growing like crazy. Right. Yeah. That's, so. I think the fastest early in the sample size that we're seeing of agencies, active campaign is growing super quickly. Anything else in the tech stack that we didn't talk about that you would want to point out? That is a great question. Um, I'm just flipping. Do you mention Superhuman, our... HubSpot, Integromat, Zapier, ConvertKit? We mentioned Active Campaign. Um, you know, obviously ClickUp. Yeah, there's a, a couple others um, that we're using really like. Obviously, Loom for quick videos back and forth has been a tool that we've uh, fallen in love with. I feel like some of these tools are super cool at the beginning and then begin to become they're the, they're the butt of the joke. But, uh, but we still like Loom a lot. Um, a couple others that we're using, uh, one is called Postaga. And then a tool called Descript for video editing. Have you played mm. with that yet? I don't know what, if you guys are just on the Adobe suite mm. for editing. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's... Descript is for the non-Rise 25s for us noobs. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's the funny. For, for, for video editing. There were some things that oh, I good. didn't... It's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. There are some things that are not as desired there, but what's yep. Postaga? What would you say about that? Yeah. So Postaga is, um, the founder, Andy, uh, Cabasso, um, they, they built a tool. He actually came out of running an agency as well, but it's a little bit of a mix of, um, cold outreach or like post promotion campaign. And we just started playing with this. There's not a great fit in what we're currently doing. Um, but for doing things like um, podcast guest outreach, and there's probably other tools that you're familiar with. Um, but this one, I keep cool. it pretty simple. Sort of, so like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, LinkedIn and email. I mean, right. it's it's really. So I don't use anything fancy. So yeah. that's awesome. There um, are fancier things out there. But yeah, those are, that's our main uh, our main kind of productivity tech stack. Um, some of the things that we've done recently, Zapier with uh, the ability to loop through. Uh, so, some of the different features that Zapier's pushed out have been really helpful for us, including mm. looping, where it can loop through a bunch of different fields. You know, here's the delimiter that we're looking for, and then loop through, find the record, and mm. keep applying them. Um, I feel like people should follow you, Gray, to see what tools your, your agency is going in all in on and then invest in those companies. So if you <laughs> look at, you went all in early on in Hub, HubSpot. Right. I mean, not only do you niche into agencies, but you tend to niche into tools for agencies. So probably I don't know what what I don't think you could invest in HubSpot at that time or anything. But you know, you and you basically made a bet that that was going to be good. And the same thing, I was talking to John Corker, my my co-founder. It's like ask Gray why he, they've gone. I mean, you do a lot of different things and help agencies, but one of the things you do do is specialize in is helping with ClickUp. And it seems like you've gone, I wouldn't say all ins, maybe a strong way to put it, but you've definitely um, are, you know, going into ClickUp and, and why is that you feel like that's a, a, like a calculated bet, you know, and why did you do it? Uh, I would say we went all in on ClickUp, probably even more so than HubSpot. And I'll, I'll kind of come back to that. But I think is, it's interesting as you ask that question, because I don't think of, you know, there's all these things that we do and there's probably our patterns there, but we don't recognize them. Sometimes outside eyes recognize them for us right away. So you put that together. I haven't really thought about that. Um, so maybe everyone should invest in ClickUp because like what HubSpot has happened since you went in with HubSpot to now. Right. Here's, so I do think though, um, I mean, the things that the, one of the main things that prompted us to move to ClickUp was similar to HubSpot in retrospect, which is they had some good initial traction and there were people who were, who cared a lot about the product. So that's a little bit of an indicator, but getting to know the early team, 
HubSpot was farther along than ClickUp was at the point that we became partners in, in 2012. Yeah, exactly. But um, the vision for where they wanted to go, they'd proven some ability to execute on it. And the vision and the product improvement velocity were the, were the big things. And I think that there's a lot of people who have the vision. I mean, you don't really get somewhere in SaaS without some type of vision for it. It's a, it's a big haul. But that ability to quickly iterate and improve uh, has been big. And ClickUp, I mean, I can't think of another SaaS company that embodies that any more than ClickUp. And not, I mean, I'm the first person to speak out about the things I dislike about ClickUp in addition to what I do like about it. Um, so that's not coming from, uh, I'm just here to promote ClickUp. Um, but they roll out uh, new features, new improvements so much more quickly than any of the other players in the space. Since you are so, you have such an intimate knowledge of ClickUp, I've watched your webinar too on Clip. I've encouraged people if they've considered it, they should go. I, I'm not sure if it's on your website. I found it on YouTube. It's you're doing a webinar with ClickUp and it yeah. was really good. Um, what are some of the features that are really, that you find are essential that people may, maybe they're using it, maybe they're not using it within ClickUp? Yeah, I think so. This goes back to speaking of going all in on ClickUp, I mean, we had a software company doing project management for agencies and we shuttered the software in favor of going in on someone else's platform and saying, hey, agencies love us because of the process. Uh, builds. That was a, seems like a, a tough decision at the time was, or not? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that was the biggest identity crisis, like would be too strong of a word, but biggest struggle with identity that Andrew and I, I think my co-founder and I have gone through where being a SaaS founder is cool and having a technology startup is way cooler than running a services-based business to, to most people. And in the eyes of people who write checks to, to buy businesses, they would agree. So uh, for us to say, hey, this is what we'd like to be, but this is not where our, our core skill set is. Um, so it's a big bet, whoever we pick to go with. And obviously we did decide to niche down. We didn't just want to have, we wanted to add the, ability to know agencies really well, the ins and outs of how you should operate, but also know the ins and outs of a software. So we could kind of, it's not just, here's what you should do, but also here's explicitly how to do it. So, and that gets back into your question around what are, what should people be using? One of the things that drew us to ClickUp was they had some of the best mapping from what we currently had at the time, back in 2017, uh, from a process or from a template building perspective. And so the ability to have your templates Pre-built timelines, dependencies. Mm -hmm. uh, Is that what you mean by mapping? There. Yeah, so basically have it all built out and then deploy from a template and remap your due dates so that whatever, you know, however you had your project set up, a new client's coming on board for you guys or a new podcast is launching. We've got a lot of our dates set up in our template and then when you roll it out in Asana, in your case, you've got all of your, all your dates mapped to the right, you know, roughly the right spaces if you need to tweak things or adjust things, that happens. So you like the mapping so you can deploy the templates and with the dates and probably assignments of people. What else do you really think um, is great? And maybe some things that are hidden gems that because you have an intimate knowledge, like you should be deploying X, Y, Z. And most people maybe, maybe don't even know those features are there. Right. The, the, the great question. The one thing that ClickUp brought to the space that's making its way into other tools, including Asana. Um, was the concept of views. So you can take all the underlying data and you can visualize it however you want to. If you like Kanban boards, you can see it that way. If you like list views, cause you're a nerd like me, you can see it that way. If you like tables or calendars or time. You are weird views. actually. When I watched the webinar, you like somehow like it in black view with white writing. That's not, that's not weird. That isn't weird. Nope. <laughs> I'm just Am kidding. I weird though? I think you're, I think you're the weird one. I feel like it's hard to read. You're right. Uh, that comes from a development background. All developers love, Dark screens. I think it's late nights coding. And oh, is that what it is? Okay. Between, I didn't know. The background. Um, I love dark mode now. For, dark mode. That's what it's called. Yeah. Uh, saving, saving me from headaches. But it was, it was funny. I mentioned that in the webinar and everyone was like, yes, dark mode. Yes, dark mode. And click up for the webinar. was like, make sure it's not in dark mode. <laughs> Keep it in light mode. Like don't, don't discourage people from the platform. So there's views, there's mapping. What else? It, do you like the, about it? The hidden feature, which you kind of asked about, it's not hidden, but it, in almost every account it's underutilized, is automations. And part of the reason it's underutilized is just until you have the basics right, you can't really 
use automations anyway. So I, I understand that. But once you get the basics right and then can start automating things. Yeah. One of our engineers this week built a really cool kind of ideas bank. So you have all these ideas backlogged. When you change the status on something, it automatically creates a task over here based on the custom field it had. It applies the right template and assigns the right people and changes the due date. And like all this stuff with automations where you can cause. What things do you function. automate? Yeah. Like what things do you like to automate? I <laughs> yeah. joke around with John. Every time he says automate, I have to take a shot because he says it so many times. Yep. And I'm totally the manual. I'll just yep. pick up the phone and call you. And like someone's like, you can create an automation with Zapier where it calls the person. I'm like, okay, right. I'll just dial the number. So I'd love to hear what automations yeah. you like. So there's a couple simple examples. A new client signs up with us <clears throat> and they're joining our guided implementation program. So we work with them over a period of 10 weeks to get all their processes documented and lined up and click of all that stuff. They'll make payment. That takes them to a ClickUp form. They'll fill out that form. That automatically creates an account for us in our account dashboard internally. And it's got, you know, here's their goals for the project. Here's the core team. Are they doing time tracking? Are they not? Are they working in Scrum, you know, agile Scrum methodology? Or are they not? Really quick, I'm going to back up for a second. Yeah. So there's a payment system integrated into this that will trigger that? There's not. No, no, no. Yeah, we're, we're using a HubSpot uh, payments link. Got it. To okay. take the payment, then redirecting them from there to this click. Okay. Form. Got it. <clears throat> so th and this is not an automation. This is just a form creates a task. And so then we'll use an automation to set a bunch of additional information that we need to based on, um, you know, them, them signing up and what services they, uh, purchased. But what that new account in Clickup will do is it'll automatically create a new task. Uh, to go through all the onboarding process. So our team gets notified right away. We can accelerate how, how quickly we can, you know, in any purchase that you make, as soon as you press submit on that credit card form, that period from that moment until the first thing that you get from that customer, that's filled with buyer's remorse. And that's the period where it's like, man, I hope that I made the right bet when I made this decision. So in any of our businesses, we want to accelerate that time to value from, hey, I made a purchase to, okay, I've heard from them. And it turns out, I was right. Everything's going to be okay. They've got me taken care of. Um, and so that using automations to trigger that and trigger the right people being notified to do the right things on time, pulling from templates. Um, that's been really helpful for us. So someone pays in HubSpot, it sends them a form. They fill out that form that goes into ClickUp and then that will set off a chain of events yeah, of to people start. to start the process of onboarding. Right. Yep. Correct. You know, this is a key point because I have this written down for us to discuss, which is I wrote down smooth onboarding because I feel like with what you do, you guys do it for yourselves, but you also help agencies do that because when you're ultimately creating, it's not sexy to say we help build out your systems, but it is sexier and nicer to say like, well, we create a smooth onboarding process from when the client buys, so they don't buy remorse and they have a good experience with the onboarding, right? And so um, what are some of those pieces? So now it triggers a chain of events. Have you seen, because you've helped build these out for agencies that needs to be included in a smooth onboarding process. So right. one is obviously quick response, like it's immediately when they buy, respond, you know, and yep. what, what are some other things that will help create a smooth onboarding? A lot of agencies try to skip a, a or just delay a kickoff call. I'm a big fan of getting a kickoff call on the books and just having kind of if assuming that there's a handoff from the sales side to the delivery team, that there's a smooth handoff that those meetings have a clear agenda. Here's what you can expect moving forward that we can set their expectations as far as how they're going to work with us. And they're hearing largely an echo of everything they were told in the sales process that that handoff or that transition in a lot of agencies is a tripping point that sets off some alarm bells in the client's mind when they heard one story from the salesperson and they got in and their account manager or whoever's leading the client services side of things is telling them a different version of what they're about to receive. So you need to make sure that those two, I think that's a fundamental relationship in agencies that has to be streamlined is the relationship between sales and client services. And so that, you know, you want that to be aligned them to have their expectations set. The cool thing about running an agency is you get to set or any services business, you get to set whatever expectations you want to about how people are going to work with you. So internally we measure NPS net promoter score like crazy and net promoter score only works if clients actually fill it out. 
So during that onboarding call, you know, we tell people that during the sales process, during the onboarding call, that's the rule that we make is you have to give us honest feedback. The, the key to this relationship, there are going to be times when you love us, there are going to be times when you're frustrated with how much work this is or how overwhelming it all seems. But you have to talk to us about that stuff. You can't just keep that inside and not tell us and we can fix it if we can communicate through it. So when you make those rules, um, it's much easier to get people's buy-in and have them actually, you know, then they're obligated to follow it because they agreed to do it on the onboarding call. Who's going to say no to something that they're asked to do on a kickoff call? Um, so a quick email, yeah. quick hit, quick off call. And on the quick off call, make sure you restate what they're getting. So there's yep. that expectation. And then also set expectations that it's okay. Like you're going to love us. And sometimes you're going to be frustrated. That's okay. We'll, we'll work through it. Um, what else with the smooth? Yep. Um, obviously the setup process, so the faster you can get them value in our case, we're setting up, you know, here's a pre-built ClickUp install for you. The faster you can turn that around in an agency case, that might be how fast can we have them fill out our design preferences questionnaire if we're doing branding or how fast can we turn around a you know, first draft of an ad campaign if we're doing paid ads. So um, figuring out what, what's needed, getting that process started. And then one of the key things that um, we've added into the, our onboarding process and do with every agency is um, there's going to be someone who's double checking before work goes out to the client, kind of double checking all the details. You know, did we, did the contract get signed? Did the invoice come in? Did we assign the right service? Did we like all these common things that are, that are kind of silly to say out loud, but in most agencies, everyone can think of examples of where we've messed that up or gotten that wrong, or there just wasn't the smooth handoff internally. Um, and then there's a, a whole bunch of other things that happen from time to time. You know, are we sending a handwritten note or a personal gift to a client who just came on board? Um, what are, what are the different things? Are we sending them any gear or not? Are we, you know, what are the things that aren't, aren't always there, but are often there that, uh, that there should be a process for. Yeah. Have you seen anyone do anything creative as far as that goes? Like those personal touch points, whether it's sending something or what have you seen? That's creative. I love to hear the, the, the kind of out ones. of the box. You know like used done... to send people a guava fruit or something. Right. Know. Right. Yeah. No. Little, little, uh, box of guava <laughs> juice. Um, <clears throat> The uh, coolest one has been um, Todd Earwood sends a box um, of all every item that he sends in his it's a little gift box of stuff. You know, there's a couple treats, cookies, or whatever, and there's a couple other decorative items and a little thing of Maker's Mark or you know whatever whatever he's he's mailing to people. But the cool thing is he's got a note in there and that note has a link to a video URL and you can go to it and it's him sitting there with a box with the exact same items unpacking it. And the whole time he's got a big smile, like welcome aboard and he's sharing the story behind each one of them. So it's not just the items themselves, but he's sharing, Hey, this is made right here in my hometown. This is the reason that I included this in your box. This is the reason I included this in your box. And I just thought it was the kind of the coolest thing that, you know, it's a small, it, you know, it costs something, but it's not a huge expense to do. And you can make that video one time and share it with people. You can include the same link if you wanted to. You can then have tracking to see, did they get the box? Did they open it? And it's kind of your feedback loop. And uh, that's my favorite example. Of yeah, of no, I love that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's really cool. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look at, and I encourage anyone to check out zenpilot.com. You know, you have on the about page, there's a timeline. So some important pieces of your timeline. And one of the pieces, which is interesting, which is Zen pilot narrows focus to helping agencies streamline their operation and click up. So you not only narrowed your focus to the type of audience, but you also narrowed it to a software, both of them. And was that narrow focus? You came to helping agencies. Was that an easy decision? Was that, did you get on a whiteboard and map this out? What, what brought you to that? Because before you, I think you were helping B2B SaaS with Guava Box, right? Right. So what was that, your thought process behind focusing on agencies? Yeah, the agency focus um, had come out of, so the software we built internally for ourselves was called Do Inbound, it was specifically for our agency. And then when we talked to other people who wanted it, they were agencies. We certainly had people sign up who weren't agencies, but all of our marketing, everything was geared towards agencies. So continuing that focus when we decided to not be the software anymore, 
um, made sense because we were, um, we weren't even sure at the time, was it just going to be, was ClickUp going to be a core part of every engagement or just some of them? You know, I don't, we're tied tightly to ClickUp, but there's an element of that. There's, there's a couple of things that accomplishes this for us. That's probably a point worth making. One, it really standardizes how we deliver value for clients. So we don't need to know, I don't need to know everything that Asana does and stay up to date on all those updates. I've got one platform and one's more than enough to try and keep up with as we're doing everything else and improve on. Um, so there's a, a delivery or an efficiency from a delivering value to clients and the depth of value that we can give people um, that have been hands on 24 seven in ClickUp since 2018. So there's not a lot of people out there who've got that, that type of experience from a um, marketing perspective because of that focus and we're tied to them and there's a partnership there. ClickUp will then either send leads to us or bring us on to lead their webinar and their training for agencies. And so that's uh, an inexpensive client acquisition channel then for us to come, come back to where we don't have to pay to go get that because we're, we're focused and we're real deep on one platform. But at the same time, that comes with some trade-offs, which are we don't need for what we're doing. We wouldn't fully need ClickUp as the platform. Like what we're teaching people to do is streamline, standardize your processes, document them, build them into your project management tool, train your whole team on how to do it, hold them accountable to that, and then reward based on performance. And that applies. You know, that's the 80% of what we're doing that would apply in any tool. It's just ClickUp's the, the most efficient way for us to deliver that value. Have you found, Greg, who are ideal agencies to work with you? Because, I, you know, agency is still, I mean, even though it's niche, it's still a broad, broad enough term. For sure. Yeah, and I think that, you know, at the beginning, we, were, we worked with a ton of inbound marketing agencies because that was our network. Those were our people. That was what we knew. Those were what our templates were for. Um, probably three or four years ago, we got into a pocket where we just had a ton of paid social and paid search agencies. Um, and then we're working with a handful of people here in the, probably the most recent kind of swath of agencies. That's a new, um, demographic for us is kind of the sales enablement, ABM, um, type agencies. And so that's, that's interesting to get to learn different, different service sets. And along the way, we've worked with a lot of web and development agencies and folks doing SEO and there's a handful of other services in there, but it's kind of interesting how we bounce around into different circles. And, and go back and forth. There's a couple characteristics that are in place. Um, one is it, the size is less of an indicator, but size is certainly an indicator. You know, average team size who works with us right now is about 12, and that's a mix from teams as small as uh, two or three to teams who are at 80 or 130 people. Um, and, but most are in that, you know, kind of eight to 20 person, uh, person range. And the one thing that's pretty consistent, they've all figured out how to deliver meaningful value to clients. So there's something real to operationalize and they wouldn't buy from us if there wasn't a path to, Hey, if we could get more efficient or we could streamline delivering this, we produce enough value that we can go acquire more clients like this. And that's important. You know, the ROI of us going in and helping someone who can't go out and sell it or isn't doing something good. Like if someone's too early on in their journey, you mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. If they haven't figured out, yeah. we at least have some idea of, of what we're doing or what we ought to be doing. And then, Having somebody who's not the owner internally in our very best fit clients, this is often the 10 to 30 or 40 person firms, someone who's not the owner, who's the internal champion, um, it's fine if the owner is involved in saying, hey, here's the things that I need out of it. But in terms of the person who's going to stick with the project for 10 weeks consecutively and do the work needed to get everything built and coordinate people internally, that one of our rules is in the long term, the internal cookup champion that we're training can never be the owner at any agency that we work with. Yeah. Um, talk about how do people engage with you? I know there's a couple different types of services that you do. Yeah. Um, so we've got kind of our custom projects. Um, custom sometimes is just a depth of how, how many different processes we're operationalizing for someone or streamlining for somebody. Um, and often a function though, of how much work we're going to wind up doing with them. So are we going to be doing a lot of the build for them and them? Like, let's say it? someone has have nothing, right. As opposed to someone has everything already built out in Asana. There's a big difference there. Oh, for sure. That was what yeah. you're saying. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or we'll get a, you know, a really large agency who comes in you know, like, we don't have the time to build any of these processes. We just need them in and work. And we'd rather pay more to have you interview our people, get the processes out and you just build them. Then you lead us through it. And then we get our people to build the processes. And, and if I could wave my magic wand for most agencies, I'd rather have the agency build it and do it alongside of us because those processes will change over time. If they don't know how to update them, we're going to go back and wind up training them again anyways, or doing the same thing. So that's well, going to one be, would be custom, like totally yeah. custom and actually just, you have to actually roll up your sleeves and get everything in there. Then we'll do like our guided implementation programs so is kind of our standardized 10 week uh, program or engagement with agencies where we're, teaching them, leading them through every step of the way. We'll do the systems design piece together. We'll put their team through our agency benchmark survey and written agency assessment, spit out what needs to happen, um, lead them through the process development. And this is where they're building it and we're reviewing and, and doing it together with them. That's kind of my, um, my favorite model for working with agencies. And we've got a program called ClickUp for Agencies that's basically, we've taken a lot of our pre-built assets and productized them. And you and I chatted a little bit about this previously, but we've got kind of our uh, ClickUp for Agencies training program, all the stuff that you need to know about setting up and migrating and training the team. And then we've got our agency project management certification that we use in every engagement with any team. We'll put every single team member through that. Say, listen, here's the rules of engagement. Here's how you execute and click up. And then our pre-built ClickUp install. And so we've got those training programs and in our ClickUp for Agencies program, it is more than, it's not fully DIY, but it's mostly DIY. You get access to those items. We run a kickoff call and then we're with you in Slack over eight weeks as you're implementing it, but you're on your own to do the actual implementation. Um, and then we'll, re we'll review it. We'll do an audit of your portal once a week as you're going through the process and make sure you're making progress. But that's more the DIY model. You know, there was um, a letter on the internet, okay, that this person wrote and it started with, I almost made a big mistake and um, talk about that. And it kind of walks through hiring an agency versus freelancer versus in-house. Yep. Just, just walk, talk to me, talk to me a little bit about that, what that person was getting at and said. Oh, super cool agency. This agency name is AO Lydia. Um, they are a Shopify. Uh, development agency and came to us and had looked at they were moving um, over to ClickUp uh, came to us and talked to some other ClickUp ClickUp's got vetted, a vetted consultants program so people who know the software in and out we're a little bit atypical in the vetted consultant community but we're also a vetted consultant um, at SimPilot everyone internally goes through certifications and um, so they'd spoken with other people came to us talked to us we were more than twice as expensive as a quote that they got from, uh, from a couple other vetted consultants. And they wound up working with us, had a really, really positive experience. And she wrote this awesome marketing email. I love the angle that she took. Um, she was writing about the experience that she had working with us and just how positive it was that we already had the stuff that we had pre-built because we're in such a tight niche felt like it was custom for them, even though it's our standard install that we're, that we're giving to people. And so the modification process and improving templates was relatively easy and you know, just kind of the, the seamless experience of, Hey, we show up on calls. They tell us exactly what to do. We can maximize our time. We know we've got confidence because this stuff's been tried before. We're not the first time that a bit of consultants working with an agency or something like that. And so she took it and said, basically used it as gave all these examples of here's what's been awesome about this experience. And here's the value of hiring an agency is you're paying for two different things. You're not paying for someone to listen to you, tell them what you want them to build. And they know how the buttons work in ClickUp. So they go build what you're saying. Uh, but they're coming in with the master plan and saying, no, based on your situation, here's what you need. Here's the way that we'd prescribe what the solution actually is. And it's probably different than what you think that it should be. And uh, so I thought it was a really cool way of kind of telling her story of, Hey, we invested in an agency in this way. And these were the results and the things that came out of it. Uh, but it was, it was a cool, cool story and a cool uh, piece to share then. Yeah, it's, it's basically more of, it's not just the value of doing the pushing the buttons. There's a, there's a strategic value there and experience value. Yeah. I mean, we see 
and obviously I'm only seeing it from our side, but we work with a lot of agencies who've hired somebody else before to do this. Sometimes as recently as, you know, a month ago, Hey, we hired a consultant. We tried to do this. We thought it, it all seemed like it looked good. But if you miss the pieces of the puzzle, which are, does the whole team know how to use it? Like, Hey, is it really the right system set up? And I don't know how you get to that without, I mean, we made so many mistakes early on. I don't know how you get to that without a lot of reps in the same type of area. Um, but then you, know, you got to get the, the team trained and there's got to be accountability and there's got, you know, there's all these different components to making it work well. And that's not the, it's really hard to compare what an agency's got. It's kind of a, Hey, this is everything that you need to be successful in a, in an initial implementation versus a, yeah, I can, I can jump in. I can start with you at $60 an hour and we can just figure it out. And you know, you'll have, you'll be live in ClickUp for 10 hours. But, but whether it's the right kind of live or not, and the team knows what to do, those are, those are two different outcomes. What would, what would be an example, Grave, of a mistake? Either you saw, you went in, you saw someone make a, it was a common mistake or that you made, or your teammate early, early on. What's, well, what's I mean, something is, you see commonly? Yeah, this is both. We messed it up and then uh, I still see it messed up pretty, pretty frequently. One of the things that's appealing, agencies obviously are service-based businesses. So your main commodity is people's time. You're, trading people's times in, in most cases for revenue of some sort. So the time tracking component is pretty important. And in ClickUp, time tracking works granularly and goes uphill. So if you've got subtasks, that time then tracks up to a parent task level, which tracks up to what ClickUp has is lists and folders and spaces and whatever. And because of that, if you're using ClickUp's time tracking, your data structure, the way that you set up your hierarchy in ClickUp becomes really important because that's going to be your feedback loop for where did your time go. So if you want to see things like profitability by client or profitability by service line or profitability by team member, that hierarchy has to be correct. So a ton of agencies will come in and they'll say, okay, here's our, our folders or clients. And then we'll do, you know, we're running retainers. So we'll say March is a list and April's a list and May's a list. And now all you really have is, time, is feedback that you would have had anyways from the time data. You don't have anything tied to service line or other things. So hierarchy is commonly built out wrong. Um, and that's a mistake that we made too. I think the one thing that based on our experience with do inbound, we we're kind of ahead of the curve in knowing. So I don't think that we've messed this up to the same extent that I most commonly see, but ClickUp is just super powerful, super flexible. People love it for that. ClickUp sells it for that. And it's an awful feature at any type of scale because everyone gets in, everyone builds their own way of, Hey, I love to see things this way. Or like, it makes sense that I should have my own personal space or my own, whatever. And there's no unification, no way to get stuff back out of it. So we do see a lot of teams who said, okay, we just want to go in and play with ClickUp for a couple months before we come back and then we'll, and then we'll work with you. And then if they do come back, you're just revamping everything. Yeah, it's basically like starting from scratch the team. And often the team is a little bit burned out on the platform because that's not working for us. And there was no coherent plan. There was no unification. I'm sure that's a little bit of a function too of being in the agency space where we're all creatives. We all have our own ideas about how things should work and we all want it to be unique and special for us. And uh, I don't know. I'm a little, I'm more of a believer in, Hey, there's a best way to do most of this stuff. Yeah. No, there's a lot that's of parallels with what you do with what we do. Yeah. And the same conversation happens. Let me just like try this out for a little bit. And if the right foundation or strategy isn't put in place from the beginning, then it's almost like, it's not like starting over, but I mean, you have to revamp a bunch of, of things. Right. You know? So I totally get that. Um, I have one last question, Gray. And first of all, thank you. And I want to point people to check out more episodes of the podcast, check out zenpilot.com um, to check out more about what they're working on. Um, you know, we were, and are there any other places we should point people towards online for you guys? No, I think, uh, zenpilot.com. If people Google click up for agencies, they'll probably come across the video that you found or our own. And we got a 4,000 word guide on the things that we've learned on, on click up as well. It might be helpful. Yeah. Check it out. Um, and you know, check out their, their podcast. Where can they find the podcast? Yeah. Zenpilot.com slash podcast. Thank you to our podcast agency journey. Um, nice. weekly interviews with agency owners and leaders. So last question, we talked about this before we hit record. Great is um, you have a scorecard that you give agencies. 
And I think it's important to just walk through a little bit of what agencies and probably, you know, any business can look at evaluating their business. So talk, walk through a little bit about the scorecard. Yeah. So this is a, um, still a work in progress to streamline it, but the, there's a couple of main things that we look at with every agency that we'd like to have gathered in terms of how client relationships are going. So I, I'm going to, we'll focus on that side. We can get into other items if you want to. Two main tools that we use, we use an internal health score. So on a weekly basis, each client uh, has their account health updated as relevant. There's you know, a brief weekly update and check-in on each client. And that's a text-based report from the account manager. Typically scale one to five. Five is, hey, we're ahead of results, the tangible results that, that they asked for. And the relationship is great. They would happily refer us. We're trending in the right direction. One is we're not hitting target. Things are trending the opposite direction. And they're very upset with us. And then there's, you know, there's standardization internally. So look at that on a client by client basis, and then obviously client average. What's our what's our average across the board? Um, and those definitions need to be need to be standardized. And then we'll look at so that's our internal scorecard, um, and we'll ask questions on a weekly basis, like why would the client be unhappy? So we're kind of digging with some of these questions. Or are you happy with the account for an for an account manager themselves? Um, a series of five basic questions that we're asking the internal account manager. So we look at that uh, health score on a weekly basis across the board for clients. And then you can obviously pare that down based on what services they have or who the account manager is. From a client perspective, though, we need the client feedback as well. And there's going to be some accountability to it. And um, those, those two things need to be measured together. So I still really like NPS, uh, just as rudimentary as net promoter score is for giving us the feedback. And then we'll, we'll track that. That goes onto our, our internal scorecard and, Agencies, especially if they're running EOS, their scorecard on a weekly basis. And here's what the NPS number is. Here's where our internal number is. And what's really interesting to track is when those two things deviate from each other. Um, and there's obviously a bunch of other, you know, client profitability metrics and on the growth and operation side, other metrics to track too. But that's kind of a, a quick glimpse at a couple of the core numbers in the scorecard. Yeah. No, I appreciate you walking through that because you're, you're starting to work through and, and get that and help agencies kind of determine their health, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, ultimately, if you hire somebody to lead, who internally leads client success for you? Are you ultimately responsible for it? Is for John, client success, you yeah, mean there as far as the onboarding? Share. or uh, Who ultimately owns whether a client stays with Rise 25 or not? Yeah, I mean, I guess we, it kind of goes up to us in the sense we have someone who is kind of a you can call them whatever they want, whatever you want, a client success manager, yep. you know, someone who handles that, but ultimately it kind of goes, goes up to us in the end. And I'd know? assume then you guys are looking at, you know, you're on a retainer model for, I would assume maybe either all engagements or most engagements. So you're looking at things like what's our churn or the opposite retention. What's the LTV of a client? Um, what's the average client paying us monthly, those types of metrics. And that's, exactly what you should be looking at, but those are all the lagging indicators. So by the time we know when people churn, like it's too late to get them back. So these are our leading in our NPS and our internal health scores. Those are our leading indicators to tell us where do we need to pay attention? Where do we need to jump in and try and fix things? Where should we be acquiring referrals? That type of thing. Totally. Great. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to get your expertise. Everyone check out zenpilot.com and uh, check out more episodes. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Gray. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.